We're working, are we? Okay, very good. Is that a little better? Okay. Uh, so I, I basically, uh, I used to work for Environment Canada, and I'm one of the three guys that actually invented the brewer. Uh, I worked with Alan Brewer back in the, uh, in the uh, early 70s when I was doing a master's degree at University of Toronto. Uh, we did the original design work for the instrument at that time, and uh, the actual design of the optics inside the instrument is very little changed from that original design and uh, has continued to do a lot of interesting things over the years. Could I have the uh, next slide? The uh, talk that I'm giving to you today is largely based on the one that I produced for the uh, anniversary meeting in uh, 2007. Uh, it was quite interesting because I started looking at the question of uh, uh, how I could get across the information about the basics of the measurement process to as wide an audience as possible, uh, especially those who had already been familiar with the Dobson and understood many of the tests and uh, characterization uh, issues that uh, the Dobson uh, required as written up in Dobson's original observer's handbook. And there are many parallels, and, and I think uh, it, it's one of these things that if you really want to understand something, you need to look at it from uh, a number of different angles, a number of different ways of looking at the problem to really grasp the, uh, the full detail. And, and this really helped me uh, to illustrate some of the, uh, the details. Of course, most people in the room are probably familiar with the, the great white box here. Uh, that was the uh, uh, Dobson number 77, which was the regional standard for uh, North America, uh, well, for Canada, basically, and uh, was the one that made its trips to Arosa and so on for calibration, and occasionally went to Hawaii on vacation to be calibrated absolutely independently of uh, the world standard in, uh, in Boulder. Can I have the next slide? So I'm going to talk about the basic physics behind making uh, measurements. That's uh, Beer's Law, the uh, first point. Uh, talk a little bit about ozone absorption, the, the nature of the spectrum of ozone, and the, uh, the, the element uh, that allows us to do measurements of ozone from uh, the ground. Uh, talk about the geometry in the atmosphere, uh, other issues that attenuate uh, light, and uh, then get on to uh, how we make a Dobson observation. And throughout the talk, I'm going to sort of switch between the Dobson and the Brewer and talk about what's similar and what's different in uh, the performance of the two instruments. Next slide. That's actually a, a copy of the cover of the uh, Dobson Handbook. It was published in uh, uh, a, a, a proper uh, uh, referee journal in, uh, in complete with uh, lots of drawings and uh, so on detail that Dobson had uh, developed in the course of uh, developing the, uh, uh, the whole process of being able to make a measurement with the Dobson. Next slide. Okay. Uh, one of the things that kind of puzzled me when I first ran into it in university was the fact that uh, the attenuation of light was actually logarithmic. It didn't kind of seem to me that that made sense. It seemed a little more complicated than it should be. But the little drawing that I've shown here actually illustrates why it is. Uh, the point is that each individual molecule uh, possesses the ability to absorb photons and has a certain affinity for photons at a particular wavelength that uh, can be expressed as a cross-sectional area for each molecule. So the more molecules you have plastering the surface here, uh, the more light will be absorbed just in proportion to the uh, total area that they uh, represent in terms of the beam passing through. On the other hand, the number of photons in terms of the intensity of light can be expressed as photons per second per square meter. And so the product of the two tells you how many photons per second are going to disappear. So at each little slab that you go through, you're going to absorb a fraction of the total amount of light. And if you integrate that up along a path, uh, you wind up with a, an expression uh, in the exponential of the total optical depth 
along the path. The uh, product of the strength of the absorption and the, uh, uh, and, and the number of molecules uh, is the total optical depth, and, and that describes the fraction of light that will disappear in each uh, little infinitesimal slab. Next slide. Uh, this is a, another picture showing the, uh, the result. The mathematical part is the little change of light is proportional to the light itself, and the depth, the optical depth, uh, attenuating the light, so that the final expression uh, shows us that the original intensity coming in on the left side compared to the intensity going out on the right side will be attenuated by e to the minus optical depth. And the, uh, the pictures here kind of illustrated in a pictorial way that uh, each additional uh, slab of uh, material will absorb a fraction of the light, and the total amount will be the product of all of the attenuations along the way. You could also think of this as, uh, let's say, uh, ozone here and Rayleigh scattering there, then the total effect of the two of them together is the product of their individual attenuations. Another important uh, aspect of absorption in the atmosphere is also illustrated here in this little picture, which is if you have a slab of stuff like a layer of ozone above us and you look through it normal to the layer, that's the actual physical amount of optical depth that the, uh, the layer can uh, produce for light traveling from outside the atmosphere vertically downward to the ground. But if we look through the layer on the angle, it appears to be thicker. And that fraction that uh, uh, describes that enhancement of the path length through there is just one over the cosine of the, the angle. Uh, in terms of atmospheric terms, uh, we measure the angle of the sun in terms of the distance from the vertical. So that's called the solar zenith angle. As the light comes in at a greater and greater angle, there's a, a larger, a larger uh, angle between the vertical and the direction the ray is coming in. And that solar zenith angle is what determines this path lengthening, often referred to as with the symbol mu. And of course, if we just rewrite the Beer's law expression in terms of uh, uh, the slant ray, then we just multiply the optical depth that the vertical ray would see by this path enhancement factor called the air mass mu, which is uh, one over cos theta or secant theta. Next slide. So, to rewrite the expression here just a little more straightforwardly, uh, the incident attenuation, which in the case of the sunlight is referred to as the extraterrestrial intensity, that spectrum of light uh, is wavelength dependent, of course, roughly a black body at 5,500 degrees K, uh, peaking around 550 nanometers and then falling off both to the, uh, the red and the infrared and toward the near UV and, and the uh, short UV. And at any individual wavelength, uh, we can actually ascribe an ability of the uh, material, ozone in this case, to absorb uh, light. Uh, in, in the form of the equation that we see here, it's actually written in terms of an absorption coefficient, which is in units of length to the minus one, multiplied by the length through the uh, material. So. Uh, if you have a constant amount of material, uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, an absorption coefficient, it's normally written as if the material is at uh, standard temperature and pressure. And uh, uh, that means that if you were thinking about the atmosphere, you'd be collecting all of the gas that you're interested in, out of all of those molecules out of the column, and squashing it down to uh, one atmosphere at standard temperature and then measuring the thickness of that layer as the amount of uh, material. So the product of the absorption coefficient and the length of uh, material that you're looking through uh, is, of course, unitless. It's uh, length to the minus one times length, and that's the optical depth. And of course, it's enhanced by the geometric path enhancement factor, uh, the air mass called uh, uh, mu. We can also write it differently in uh, more physical terms which is to think about the density of uh, ozone in the atmosphere, the, the number of molecules per cubic centimeter or cubic meter. And in those terms, then, the uh, proportionality constant is uh, normally referred to as sigma, the cross-section for uh, 
absorption in centimeters squared. Of course, one of the interesting things is that we, we think we've all converted to SI units, uh, standard international units, and of course the length unit ought to be the meter. But unfortunately, uh, in uh, atmospheric science, the cross-sections have all been measured in uh, centimeters squared, not in meters squared. So the uh, CGS units creep back in in terms of these optical equations all the time. And it, it's a bit of a nuisance because when you start doing some computer modeling or something, you have to be very, very careful that you keep track of the units you're using or you can be out by several orders of magnitude. The only difference between, obviously, that term, the number density times the cross-section, it has to be precisely equal to the uh, absorption uh, coefficient times the length. And the connection between them is the standard number of molecules per cubic centimeter at STP. And uh, it's just a question of whether you normalize one term or the other term uh, relative to uh, one atmosphere, as the equations here show. Next slide. Ozone has quite a lot of uh, uh, absorption activity in the, uh, in, the, in the spectrum, stretching from uh, its peak around 250 nanometers, where it's an extremely strong absorber. Uh, Brewer told me that one of his students one time uh, took a look at uh, the question of how strong is that absorption really in terms of uh, our interests living down here on the ground. And he calculated that if the ozone layer had been there since the uh, universe was created, uh, that uh, there might have been one photon that made it to the ground, but there wouldn't have been two. It's that strong. The absorption is extremely strong. It's about 100 and, uh, I think it's 250 or something like that uh, in units where the uh, uh, area that we're actually worried about down here around uh, 300, you can see, is one, two, three, four, four and a half orders of magnitude smaller. And it's already absorbing virtually all of the UV that uh, comes down from the sun. There's also a very interesting band in the uh, in the in the mid uh, uh, infrared or in the deep red, really peaking around 600 nanometers, uh, called the Chapuis band, uh, which is very important for making measurements uh, from space, where you're looking sideways through the atmosphere and the path length is extremely long. Uh, the region that we're interested in is in the, in the Huggins band here. Uh, just in the near UV between uh, about 310 and 325 nanometers uh, in terms of making measurements with both the uh, Brewer and the Dobson. Where does ozone come from? Well, ozone actually comes from sunlight. It's down in this region uh, around uh, 100 nanometers where the photons have sufficient energy to actually blow oxygen molecules apart and produce uh, atomic oxygen. And then the atomic oxygen uh, joins up with uh, molecular oxygen to form uh, ozone. And a balance is achieved between production and loss so that we produce an ozone layer at about 22 kilometers uh, in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a, uh, another uh, spectrum of ozone produced by the, uh, the GOM uh, team. Uh, I've also enhanced it with uh, data from uh, Lyon that uh, goes out into the uh, area called the wolf bands. So you can see it's a very lively spectrum, but uh, the, mo the, the most important part in terms of human life is the fact that the UV part of the absorption here in the Hartley-Huggins band uh, removes uh, virtually all of the UV reaching the ground short of 300 nanometers. Next slide. I've uh, got a, a diagram here showing where all the different wavelengths uh, for the, the Dobson have been set. The Dodson basically only measured two wavelengths. It measured the ratio of the intensities at two wavelengths. Uh, the long wavelength is virtually unattenuated by ozone, and uh, the short wavelength is uh, uh, varyingly attenuated. You can see that as, as you go along here, the uh, absorption coefficient changes extremely rapidly. So going from A, B, C, D wavelengths, uh, you have a, quite a large change in the amount of absorption. What this means is that you can use uh, the wavelengths at the short end when you've got a very small optical depth of ozone so that there's a strong signal to measure. And as you get uh, to uh, larger and larger amounts of ozone in the path, you can make a successful measurement by moving to areas that have 
uh, a smaller amount of attenuation. There's almost an order of magnitude change there in the uh, cross-section of ozone between that uh, uh, range from A to, to D. Next slide, please. The Brewer actually measures about five wavelengths at once. They're shown on here. And uh, basically the four longest wavelengths are combined to make an ozone measurement that's independent of uh, absorption by other uh, things in the atmosphere. And the shortest wavelength is uh, uh, sensitive to SO2, so the instrument can make measurements of both ozone and SO2 at the same time. Next slide. The whole picture uh, gets a little more complicated than the uh, simple Beer's Law at one wavelength. The problem with measuring one wavelength is that the instrument has to be absolutely calibrated and you have to make the assumption that the sun isn't changing. Otherwise you don't know what the incident intensity was. Now that's obviously a really tough prescription to say that you're going to make an absolute measurement of intensity with an instrument over long periods of time. And it also means that you are in a situation where if there's any other kind of absorption going on, uh, you're not going to be able to distinguish it from ozone. But by measuring a pair of wavelengths that are reasonably close together, if something else is absorbing, but absorbing pretty much the same at both wavelengths, for instance, aerosol absorption in the atmosphere, then the ratio of those two wavelengths will be independent of the effect of aerosol, things that change slowly with wavelength, but will still have a strong signal due to the ozone itself. So if we actually add up all of the possible things that might be going on here and uh, include them in the equation, uh, basically it's the, uh, uh, a whole series of things here. We've taken the logarithm of the equation, so it becomes a, a linear equation. So the log of the incident intensity and the log of the observed intensity after passing through the atmosphere. Uh, we have absorption due to ozone, the air mass times the absorption coefficient times the amount of ozone. Uh, we have uh, effects due to Rayleigh scattering, uh, the Rayleigh scattering, the strength of Rayleigh scattering being represented by uh, the Greek letter beta, and M being the air mass for air. The reason that there's a difference between mu and M here is because the ozone layer is a thin layer way high in the sky, and the atmosphere is distributed exponentially with the, most of the atmosphere, the highest pressure being near the ground. And of course, the Earth isn't flat, and the characterization of the air mass as 1 over cos theta is assuming essentially a flat Earth with a, a thin layer. And uh, so it's the expression here can be evaluated using a different air mass to uh, account for the distribution of air as compared to the distribution of ozone. Uh, we might also have uh, effects from uh, some other absorber, for example, uh, aerosol. And then the question is, the air, the air mass for that particular constituent has to reflect the way that it is distributed. And finally, uh, we have the SO2 absorption out at the end. And next slide, please. So basically, uh, if we uh, consider just an atmosphere with, uh, with ozone and Rayleigh scattering, and we pretend that it's a, a simple case of the layers being appropriate to a flat Earth, uh, the equation will look like this. And uh, the question is, how do, how do we determine what the I0 is when we're down here on Earth and we can't actually see the sun without any absorption in between? So what we do is we use a thing called the Langley plot. Uh, if you assume that the absorber that you're looking at, in this case ozone, is up in the uh, upper atmosphere and it's in a thin layer, then there's going to be a certain amount of ozone in the vertical and then the enhanced amount uh, enhanced by the air mass factor. If you then plot your observations throughout the day as a function of that, that particular value, the air mass, uh, if you extrapolate that curve down to zero, the unphysical situation of having nothing absorbing in the atmosphere, uh, you can actually predict what that extraterrestrial value will be. And that allows us to estimate uh, the value that we would see the instrument reading if there were no ozone in the atmosphere. In the laboratory, we could actually measure the, the, uh, the cross-section or the uh, absorption coefficient 
So we know what the response of the instrument is to ozone. We know if we double the amount of ozone, what's going to happen to the instrument reading. But we don't know what the zero is. So the process of calibrating the instrument is first to determine exactly what the effective absorption coefficient is, and then go out into the atmosphere somewhere like Mauna Loa, where the ozone doesn't change from day to day or throughout the day, and then we can extrapolate back to the case with no ozone. Next slide, please. So this is how it works. There's the uh, vertical path through the atmosphere at some solar zenith angle, and the path lengthening factor M representing the geometric enhancement of the absorption. Now, one of the problems that I already highlighted is if you try to make a measurement of the absolute intensity, number one, you have the question of long-term stability of the instrument, and number two, the question of whether there's some other absorber that might be interfering with your measurement. So the basic Dobson or Brewer starting point here is to consider a, a long wavelength of light where the ozone absorption is essentially negligible and a short wavelength where there's significant absorption. Now here's the Beer's Law expression for both cases, the, the uh, extraterrestrial values at the two different wavelengths and the slightly different, well, maybe largely different uh, optical depths at the long and the short wavelength. If we simply uh, take the log of those equations and subtract them, uh, it's equivalent of taking the ratio of the intensities. Then we can write down an expression like this, simply by subtracting them. So we have what we call the differential uh, cross-section here, or differential coefficient here, which is the difference in the uh, absorption due to ozone at the two different wavelengths, and the amount of ozone and the air mass. And if you uh, make a definition associating the, rate, the log of the ratio with this symbol F for the absorption function, uh, you can see that that expression is actually just a simple linear expression. And we can solve it by uh, dividing by the uh, difference in the absorption coefficient and the calculated air mass to produce the amount of ozone. So once we've actually done a, a series of measurements through the day, extrapolated back to zero air mass uh, to determine the F0, the value that we would see if there was no ozone in the atmosphere, then we can directly calculate the amount of ozone at any time throughout the day. So the whole process of uh, calibrating instruments is to have uh, at least some instruments go to a location like Mauna Loa or Idania for that matter and uh, be able to do the zero air mass extrapolations and then those instruments can be used to calibrate other instruments by transferring the, the calibration from one instrument to another. Next slide, please. So this is the, uh, the way it works. Uh, in the uh, earlier slide, it was talking about a long method for measuring ozone, which is simply to assume the ozone doesn't change, and then the slope of the line uh, allows you to calculate the value of uh, ozone. But the other possibility is, as I've discussed, if we can actually uh, extrapolate and discover what the value of the log of I0 is, or the log of the ratio uh, of uh, two wavelengths with no ozone in the path, then we can take each individual point that we've measured and do the calculation of the amount of ozone on a point-by-point -point basis. And of course, that's how both the Dobson and the Brewer are used to measure ozone throughout the day. Next slide. One of the uh, important things that you have to do is to actually calculate what the effective uh, value of the absorption coefficient is. No instrument is perfect. And, we, it, and it's impossible to make a measurement at infinitely high resolution. The spectrum of light, of course, is a continuous function. It's not just values at specific wavelengths. It's a continuous function. But if you were to build a practical instrument and, and, and make that wavelength interval go down to zero, the amount of signal you'd have would go down to zero as well. So in, in actual fact, you have to choose some uh, band pass, some uh, difference in wavelength uh, that you allow into your instrument in order to make practical measurement. And having done that, then you have to take into account that you're actually adding together photons of a number of different wavelengths and account for that in calculating the effective uh, absorption coefficient that the instrument has given that finite uh, wavelength uh, interval. Uh, in the case of the Dobson, 
uh, the uh, standard process for calibrating instruments is to attempt to make the passband of all of the instruments the same as the reference instrument so that you can then assume that the coefficient is the same uh, as the reference instrument and then you only have to transfer the uh, uh, extraterrestrial value. In the case of the Dobson, it actually directly measures the ratio of light at the long and the short wavelength by using a, uh, a chopper wheel and a phase sensitive detector and then calibrating a variable attenuator. Uh, the light coming through at the long wavelength will always be brighter than the short wavelength and of course sometimes very much brighter because of the big change in ozone uh, absorption between the long and the short wavelength. And so the use of an attenuator that attenuates the long wavelength until it matches the intensity of the short wavelength is a direct way to measure the ratio of intensities of the two. So a, a variable attenuator is, is operated uh, by a, a mechanical uh, uh, control and the index value off that, uh, that dial is called the R value and then the R value uh, is used to look up the actual attenuation in a calibration table. Next slide, please. So the clever part of the Dobson was the fact that uh, by measuring the ratio of two wavelengths directly, the absolute intensity measurement made by the instrument is not relevant. You're only using the detector to detect the balance between the two. You're not using it to actually tell you the intensity of either wavelength. Rayleigh scattering is uh, another attenuation that we had in the original equation. And of course, uh, by knowing the surface pressure on the ground, we can make a, a fairly accurate uh, estimate of the total amount of attenuation uh, at each wavelength. Rayleigh scattering uh, changes at the uh, rate of uh, wavelength to the minus four. And so there's uh, quite a rapid change in the uh, uh, cross section as a function of wavelength. And so you cannot assume that simply because the two wavelengths of the Dobson are close together that they're going to have the same Rayleigh scattering uh, effect. Uh, you have to actually calculate a correction based on the, uh, the surface pressure and the angle the sun is making to the vertical. Next slide, please. Even calculating the air mass is not straightforward. Uh, until you get down to about 70 degrees, uh, the flat Earth is approximation is reasonably accurate. But if you start getting to larger solar zenith angles, then it's necessary to take into account the fact that the ozone is actually uh, a thin spherical layer around the Earth. And the angle that the light makes going through the ozone layer is a little bit different than the angle it makes uh, to the, uh, the vertical at the position of the observer. And it's a fairly straightforward uh, thing. You solve the, uh, the triangle here, and uh, it comes out like that, which produces a, a simple equation that can be used to calculate the, uh, the air mass approximately. One point that uh, I should make here is that there's a, essentially uh, an inaccurate assumption here that's been built right into all of the Brewer software, which is that this is an exact representation of the air mass. And it isn't quite right because uh, the distance between the observer and the ozone layer depends not only on the ozone layer height, but it also depends on the altitude of the station that's doing the observing. So uh, th this assumption that uh, 22 kilometers works for all locations is not, not exactly correct. At the same time, the ozone layer actually changes its altitude. It's uh, around uh, 22 kilometers here, but as the tropopause gets higher and higher toward the equator, uh, the ozone layer is actually uh, higher as well. Next slide, please. Dodson's original measurement started with uh, a bunch of wooden boxes like this. Uh, this is one that's on the wall in the lab at uh, Environment Canada in Toronto. There's also one on display at Oxford in uh, the UK. And there's one in the uh, Science Museum in London. Uh, Dobson originally built, I think, about eight of these and distributed them in a network around Europe to uh, understand the uh, distribution of ozone and the temporal changes in ozone and discovered the correlation between uh, total ozone measurements 
and the general uh, weather patterns in Europe. Uh, after he finished doing that work, the instruments were dispersed around the globe and developed the first uh, global climatology of ozone. It was very difficult in those days to make these measurements. Uh, the instrument is actually a prism spectrograph. There's a, a, a quartz crystal prism mounted here that disperses the light. And the original measurements were made using uh, glass photographic plates that were exposed at the focal plane. This instrument had been modified to include a photomultiplier detector uh, inside that metal box. But the original measurements made with the uh, glass plates, the plates were, uh, uh, were created in Oxford and then sent out to the individual stations. Uh, measurements were made and then the uh, plates were sent back to Oxford to be uh, calibrated and developed according to a standard process so that there would be uniformity in the effective sensitivity of the system to ozone. In fact, Dobson developed, uh, I think it was the first uh, photodensitometer to be able to actually digitize the, uh, the information on the photographic plates. And by digitize, it, it means digits. The measurements were taken with, a, with a, an analog meter and written down, and then the uh, logarithms were calculated with 10-digit uh, 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 log tables. It was all done by hand. Quite a big difference from the way we make measurements today, and very painstaking. Next slide, please. Uh, clearly, th th this was a really difficult thing because A, you couldn't make a measurement and know what the ozone was because you had to t expose the plates and then wait for weeks while they were sent back to Oxford to be developed and digitized and ca ozone calculated. And so Dobson wanted to have an instrument that would uh, make the measurement electronically and not require all that uh, extra uh, trouble and possibly to make a more accurate measurement. So in the mid-30s, uh, the uh, Dobson spectrometer, as we know it now, uh, went into, uh, into service. Uh, this is a, a general outline of uh, how the optics go together. Uh, the light comes in through uh, a, uh, a port vertically downward. It passes through an entrance slit, and then it's dispersed by the uh, by a double reflection through the or a, a double refraction rather by hitting a mirror and passing twice through the uh, quartz prism. Uh, the focal plane over here is set up to have uh, two slits, one of which is uh, uh, at longer wavelengths and the other at shorter. Uh, the uh, system has a chopper wheel shown here which allows you to open and close the slits alternately very rapidly. And then the signal that you detect is put through a phase sensitive rectifier so that you can measure the uh, different signal very accurately. Once the light has gone through the, uh, the slits here, it passes essentially backwards through an identical spectrograph uh, to be recombined at the exit slit and detected by the photomultiplier detector. Of course, in the original Dobson, it was a photodiode, uh, uh, a vacuum photodiode. But in the more recent instruments, the more sensitive uh, photomultiplier has replaced that. The reason for having it go through two, two, two halves like this is to improve the spectral quality. If you remember, it was like an order of magnitude change in the attenuation due to ozone at uh, the wavelengths that we're measuring uh, between the long and the short wavelength. That means that uh, the short wavelength is attenuated by factors of 100 or 1,000 or more when the uh, amount of ozone becomes large. The problem is that any kind of uh, uh, improper path of light through the spectrograph here, uh, for instance, uh, the reflection off the, uh, uh, the surface of the prism, uh, any dust, anything in there that would cause light to uh, bounce around inside the instrument, could lead to a little bit of the long wavelength light, which is extremely bright compared to the short wavelength light, going through the wrong slit. And so if you have a background of light from the long wavelengths that's added into the short wavelength, as the amount of ozone goes up, eventually the attenuation of the short wavelength will cease because you're seeing the wavelength that is not attenuated by ozone. So if, let's say we have an instrument that here has the quality factor of one in a thousand that uh, one photon in a thousand from the long wavelength gets through the short wavelength slit, then that would limit us to being able to measure an attenuation of only, you know, 50 or 100 
to a precision of a percent. So by putting it through the second instrument backwards, the light that came through the wrong slit will fail to reach the exit slit. And so the quality of the instrument becomes the square of the quality factor of uh, the one half. Next slide. And there's a, a Dobson in the lab in Toronto in pieces. You can see the basic elements here. There's the, the mirror and the prism and the uh, collimating lens. So the entrance slit would be up here. The light travels there. There's the, uh, the shaft of the uh, chopper and uh, the detector is mounted up here. You can see some electronics in the background. In the original Dobson, they actually used a clockwork motor to run the, uh, the chopper and vacuum tubes to do the uh, phase sensitive detection. Uh, you can see in the front here the analog meter for detecting the balance between the long and the short wavelength as the attenuator uh, knob mounted on this shaft here uh, is moved. The attenuator itself is composed of uh, two uh, uh, quartz uh, plates that have uh, an attenuator uh, deposited on them that changes logarithmically along its length and the two plates are moved simultaneously uh, to try and make the attenuation change across the width of the slit uh, as uniform as possible. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a diagram of the uh, optics for the brewer. Uh, rather than using a prism, uh, the, the brewer uses a reflective uh, grating. Uh, the, uh, there, there are a number of different uh, gratings used in different versions of the instrument. The, uh, the, the Mark II uses an 1800 line grating in the second order. In the first order, it would be uh, measuring around 600 nanometers. In the second order, it's around 300 nanometers. Uh, the Mark III uses 3600 line gratings in the first order, uh, so that it's not necessary to use a band limiting filter. Because you have light from both the first order and the second order arriving at the detector, it's necessary to have a filter in front of the detector that removes the order that you're not measuring. And in the, uh, the Mark II and Mark IV brewers, the, the filter is composed of uh, nickel sulfate crystal and uh, cobalt glass. And that produces a, a window from uh, about uh, short of 290 nanometers out to about 345, so that uh, only the light from the second order in the uh, grating will actually make it to the detector. The, the entrance slit is uh, located around here, and uh, the light comes in in a beam and strikes a spherical surface here. The first reflection off the surface produces a, a quasi-parallel beam that uh, impinges on the grating. And of course, different wavelengths will come off the grating at different angles uh, due to the interference uh, of the uh, light sources associated with each of the lines. And so we have a spectrum dispersed across the uh, focal plane down here. The, the second reflection off the grating produces the image, which is the spectrum along the focal plane. Now, of course, we've got the whole spectrum along that surface, and we only want to measure particular wavelengths. So there's a stainless steel plate mounted there that's had slots precision machined in it with a, a laser machining uh, system uh, to put the relative positions of those slits at exactly the positions where we want the wavelengths to measure ozone with. In order to measure one wavelength at a time, there's a stepping motor with a uh, uh, cylindrical uh, chopper on it that allows us to open and close the individual slits very rapidly. In fact, it makes a measurement on one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one, uh, in about 1.2 seconds. So we have a, a very uh, rapid multiplexing between the, the different wavelengths in order to make a quasi-simultaneous measurement at all of the wavelengths we need to make the ozone measurement. While the relative locations of the, uh, the slits are highly controlled and l line up with the wavelengths that we want to measure, the absolute wavelength of the, uh, the beam depends on the exact angle of the grating and the precise number of lines and the exact focal length of the, of the mirror and so on. So there's a mechanism here to actually be able to precisely uh, rotate the grating to move the spectrum back and forth along that surface. And that's uh, done using a, uh, a micrometer drive. Uh, in, in a talk later 
in the series, I'll talk a little bit about the nature of the mechanics required to do this in an extremely precise manner to get these wavelengths exactly uh, located. Uh, the computer can control the uh, position of that uh, arm and we can look at emission features in, in the uh, mercury lamp emission lines in order to ascertain exactly which wavelength is uh, landing on the, uh, on the uh, exit slit uh, plate in order to precisely uh, maintain the wavelength uh, settings to keep the absorption coefficient constant so that we can make uh, traceable long-term uh, measurement of uh, ozone. Next slide, please. Dodson was, one I mentioned already, one of the first to, to use a phase-sensitive detector. And uh, one of the tests that uh, uh, he needed to do was to make sure that uh, the, uh, the chopper was uh, switching in and out at exactly the right point. Uh, if, you, if you switch the, the chopper at, at the right position, you get the full positive and full negative signal uh, from the two slits and, and get the most sensitivity. Uh, if you're not switching it at the right point, then you, you add together some positive going signal and negative going signal. If you're exactly out of phase, you would see nothing at all. And so one of the tests that uh, he had to do was to actually uh, uh, use a, a mechanism to uh, adjust the phasing of the detector to get the uh, largest signal. Next slide. In the case of the Brewer, a uh, corresponding test is to uh, get the, uh, the timing of the uh, stepping motor right so that we get as much light through the instrument as possible. Uh, for efficient operation, you want to get as much light through as you can. Uh, the design here is to, to do it in the ratio of about seven to eight. In other words, we use about one-eighth of the time to move the motor and seven-eighths of the time to have it stopped with the light coming through and counting photons. Uh, we actually turn off the photon counts electronically during the time when the motor is moving, so we're actually only counting photons during the seven-eighths of the available time. And of course, the, uh, any, any kind of system uh, which has a strong restoring force in it, in this case the motion of the motor, if you simply switch it from one position to another quickly, uh, if there are small losses in the system, it will actually move from one position to the other and then oscillate for a while until it stops. In order to avoid that, we actually uh, send a waveform in that, uh, whose Fourier transform does not include the fundamental frequency of oscillation. So the motor will actually move very quickly to a new position and stop. And so the SH test, the shutter test, is actually used to determine exactly what the time constant needs to be in that motion so that it will move and have as little vibration as possible. And it's left turned off long enough that residual oscillation dies out before we begin making a measurement. Clearly, if it was oscillating randomly, you'd be sometimes counting photons and sometimes losing some of them uh, and not making an accurate measurement. So to, to maintain an accurate measurement, the timing is done electronically and the uh, timing of the motion of the motor is done so that uh, it oscillates as little as possible. Next slide, please. So as I've already indicated, the instrument actually uh, moves rapidly between the different wavelengths. Uh, the counting is inhibited while it's moving so that we don't contaminate the measurement. And uh, the uh, uh, tests are done to ensure that we're actually doing all of this properly. If the system were uh, oscillating and mixing up the light coming from different slits, we wouldn't be making a good measurement of ozone, and the measurement would be changing from time to time. So we actually do tests to compare whether the uh, efficiency of the chopping system is really 100%. We compare quasi-static measurements on a steady source where we measure at each individual slit for a long time with no motor motion. And then the run-stop test allows us to compare the ratios of the different slits when it's in dynamic mode compared to the measurements made when it's in static mode to ensure that we're actually making an accurate relative measurement of all the wavelengths. Next slide, please. Measurement linearity is an issue. I, I, I said that uh, 
you know, the, the good thing about the Dobson is that it does the ratio measurement so that the absolute sensitivity of the detector is unimportant. The bad thing about the Dobson is you don't know what the absolute intensity is. So you can't make an estimate uh, of the uncertainty in the measurement in, in a direct physical manner. And the other problem is that you have to calibrate that damn attenuator, which is a very complicated task and produces uh, tables that uh, have to be used to translate the readings into actual uh, values that you can uh, turn into ozone amounts. Uh, if you have a system that actually measures the absolute intensity and it's linear, then you can directly calculate the ratio of the intensities and therefore the ozone without any need to uh, do a translation through a calibration system. Next slide, please. In the Brewer, uh, the linearity test is done explicitly uh, using the uh, instrument itself. Uh, one of the positions of the chopping motor that switches between different slits actually has two slits open at the same time. And so we can actually measure the intensity on one slit, the intensity on the other slit, and the total intensity with both slits open at the same time. The nature of photon counting, the nature of measuring light, is a random process. We can know the average number of photons per second that arrive during an interval, but we can't know the exact number of photons that arrive in any particular interval. Uh, the statistics that govern the arrival of photons is called Poisson statistics. And if we make the assumption that once a photon has been counted, that the detector won't be able to count another one for a while, this is called the dead time, uh, we can write a simple mathematical model using Poisson statistics that tell us the true count rate that is actually being uh, uh, generated by light falling on the detector compared to the count that we actually make with our detector. Uh, the equation is fairly simple. It's the, the count rate times this characteristic time when the detector is unable to make a measurement. So the light, the number of photon counts that we actually see is smaller than the number of photons that are actually arriving attenuated by that factor. So in the case of each individual slit, we'll be seeing an A and a B that are related to a original photon count rate as compared to the actual measured photon count rate. And if we put the light of both of them on the detector at the same time, then we have a slightly different expression. And it's possible numerically to solve this uh, set of equations and determine what the, uh, the dead time actually is. Next slide, please. So once we've uh, determined the dead time, then of course we know how to solve the equation backwards to get the true count and we can use the true count to calculate the amount of ozone. One of the questions is, uh, what exact wavelength should we set the instrument to to make a measurement? We, we've selected a set of five wavelengths that are optimum for measuring ozone and, separate, and, and ignoring SO2, and conversely, ignoring ozone and measuring SO2. But if we actually put the instrument out there, what we would like is for very tiny changes in wavelength, not to change the amount of ozone, right? We'd like to have the micrometer setting the angle of degrading such that if it moves just a little bit, we don't have uh, a big change. And so once we've calculated where these slits should be and estimated the absorption coefficients and so on, we actually go out and, and change the micrometer setting a little bit and see what happens when we look at the solar spectrum and maybe move the thing by a few steps so that it is actually on an extreme point to minimize the variability. See, all instruments respond to more than just the thing you want to measure, right? Uh, the instrument might respond to temperature changes. Uh, it might respond to pressure changes, vibration. Uh, many different things could be affecting a reading. And if you're to make an accurate measurement, you have to understand and characterize the behavior of the instrument so that you can determine the amount of response it makes to these extraneous factors, uh, maybe design in a cure so it doesn't respond to them, or in fact, in the end, make some kind of uh, adjustment to the, to the data in order to minimize the effect. So in this case, by uh, adjusting the precise position of the slits, we can minimize the uh, effect of any small changes in the instrument 
due to temperature changes or vibration effects. Uh, Dobson did exactly the same thing uh, when he made measurements with the wavelength pairs. He'd actually go out there and, and adjust the wavelength settings a little bit and see what happens to the, uh, the reading that the instrument makes. And then he would pick the right position to minimize the change. See, if we, if we set it to here, if you make a small wavelength shift, it's going to change the reading. But if we set it here or here, a small change will have a very small effect on the instrument reading. Next slide, please. So we do the same thing with the, the brewer. It, it can actually do it automatically. Uh, here's a picture of the effective ozone value that it's uh, reading out here from about 320 to 350 uh, Dodson units. And these are step numbers of the motor that adjusts the uh, grading angle. And uh, the instrument plotted the, the values of uh, ozone that it measured as a function of step position. And so we would pick a position that minimizes the, uh, the change in ozone as a function of step number. Next slide, please. So we observe the, uh, the sun under clear conditions. If you're making a series of measurements that you want to compare, you want to do them under uh, stationary conditions so that the differences in the individual values are actually significant. Uh, we scan by changing the uh, diffraction grading uh, angle and find an extreme point uh, that's a good compromise between the ozone and SO2 absorption functions uh, near the uh, nominal calibration point. Uh, once we've decided on the precise position of the, uh, uh, the micrometer setting, then we can go back and use the dispersion equation for the instrument to recalculate the exact absorption coefficient at every wavelength and therefore the differential uh, absorption coefficient. Next slide, please. One of the uh, things that uh, goes on, of course, is that because ozone is a major influence on the spectrum that we see, it actually changes the slope of the solar spectrum throughout the day because of the path enhancement for ozone. So there's actually a, a dependence of, the, uh, of that peak value uh, on the amount of ozone in the atmosphere. So we uh, arbitrarily uh, chose a particular reference point, which was assuming a, a standard amount of ozone, about 350 Dobson units, and setting the uh, maximum at the mid-range of our observing day. Uh, we normally make measurements between an air mass of one and an air mass of three. So uh, in order to have a reference point, we decided, well, we'll assume that the amount of ozone there is uh, 350 Dobson units multiplied by air mass two, just in the middle of the observing day. And that's the uh, standard reference point for deciding where the uh, uh, step position should be. Uh, that splits the difference between the peak moving one way at uh, low ozone values and moving the other way at high ozone values. Next slide, please. Now, when we need to calibrate the instrument, of course, we need to be somewhere, as I mentioned before, like Mauna Loa Observatory. Uh, in, the, uh, in the tropics and subtropics, uh, ozone tends to be uh, very stable from day to day and throughout the day. And so by going to an observatory that's uh, near the equator, it's possible to make the assumption that ozone is stationary through half days and do the Langley plot in order to extrapolate to what the instrument would measure if there were no ozone in the atmosphere. Mauna Loa is particularly nice because of the altitude. It means that uh, tropospheric ozone is uh, not important, which is much more likely to vary throughout the day. And at the same time, uh, the amount of uh, aerosol uh, and cloud and so on is m minimum because of the altitude. So with the Brewer, we can do direct regression against air mass. There are a lot of uh, details about calibrating instruments, and in particularly calibrating Dobsons, that uh, are very interesting. But uh, in fact, with the Brewer, because everything is computerized, it's quite easy to do a direct regression in order to uh, assume the, uh, or to determine the extraterrestrial. One of the, the concerns that we had all along was that if you actually calibrate an instrument, and then you have to ship it somewhere, maybe it won't be calibrated anymore when it gets where it's going. So the approach that we chose to use with the Brewer was to actually use a traveling instrument so that, A, you don't have to take the station instrument out of service and send it somewhere and lose the data, and B, 
you don't have to wonder what's going to happen when you calibrate it two or three years later and find out that it was out of calibration the whole time because it got damaged on the way back. Next slide, please. So uh, in the days before uh, computers, when uh, Dobson was doing these things by, by hand, he actually used a method of uh, uh, correction. They would, they would guess an extraterrestrial and then make a plot against one over air mass and determine a correction to the uh, extraterrestrial and uh, thereby uh, make a, a much more uh, accurate estimate of the extraterrestrial because they could make plots that expanded the, uh, uh, the error, if you like, in the extraterrestrial uh, a lot easier to determine. Next slide. With the Brewer, we can do it a little more directly. Uh, it's possible to use Dodson's technique as well, but for uh, general use, uh, a, a direct uh, weighted uh, linear regression produces a, an extraterrestrial value at air mass zero here. You can see real values can only be determined down to air mass one. That's the minimum path length we can achieve through the atmosphere. But we can very accurately extrapolate to air mass zero. And then the difference between that value and the line at every point is the total amount of absorption in the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So having uh, successfully determined the extraterrestrial, we can make a direct calculation of ozone if we know what the uh, solar zenith angle is and can calculate the uh, uh, F naught. You can see this is uh, more akin to the, uh, the Dobson approach for calculating the uh, uh, extraterrestrial. Next slide. So that's an example of doing the one over air mass plot. Uh, the extraterrestrial and the uh, ozone value uh, exchange places in the equation when you uh, do the uh, plot these two different ways. Next slide. There you go. So are, are there questions? There is mud. Yes. So with Dobson spectrometer, do you use, do they use uh, different uh, wavelength pairs when you uh, define the ozone if their air mass is big or small? Uh, yeah, that's right. Can, could yeah. that be done with Brewer? I mean, because Brewer always uses the four, but with uh, high air mass, the smallest wavelengths give the stray light problem. So if we just use the pair of two longest wavelengths, could that be done? It, it could be done. I mean, one of the problems that's uh, always existed with the Dobson is the question of whether the uh, coefficients at different wavelengths are going to be consistent, right? Uh, in fact, to this day, no one knows why the B wavelength doesn't work. Right? So you, you introduce another problem when you start switching wavelengths because you have to somehow make sure that you get answers that are uh, coherent when you're switching, right? Uh, in the beginning, we were just, you know, we were kind of surprised, but the uh, fixed four wavelengths work really very well over quite a large uh, path length of ozone, and we just left it alone like that. Uh, but you're quite right. Eventually, we, we discovered the stray light problem, and, and, and that certainly is an issue. And that could be avoided by switching to longer wavelengths. The only problem is that uh, you, you want to make sure that the relative positions of all of the slits are really solidly fixed. So if you move to another set of wavelengths, you, you may not be able to find an optimum position for uh, exactly where to put it. And so there are practical issues about being able to do that. But in principle, it's true. And in fact, the, the Brewer Mark V that we uh, develop is doing exactly that. Uh, it's switching into the Chapuis band and using the red part of the spectrum when the sun angles get really large at very large uh, column amounts of ozone, right? like you have in the spring and fall in high latitude. But there's no point in calculating new coefficients for just two wavelengths and use those? Well, use again, ex existing you, you, you wavelengths. have to look at it from a practical standpoint. Uh, the use of multiple wavelengths uh, on the Brewer 
uh, allows you to make it very much insensitive to uh, other effects. And you'd have to look at the individual case. Uh, I, would, I would guess that you wouldn't want to go to just a single pair. But uh, whether you need three or four, you'd have to determine practically. And then, of course, you'd have to go out and explicitly uh, do measurements over large amounts of ozone path in order to make sure that you don't have to correct for uh, inconsistencies in the wavelengths. Uh, the coefficients have different wavelengths. Uh, what, what I've opted to do, uh, and we're, we're just trying to get a paper together, is to actually come up with a nonlinear calibration for uh, the instrument that can use the data from Mauna Loa to produce a correction, essentially, to, to straight. Anyway, I, I guess basically I'd say I, I was surprised in a way that the four, four and five wavelength measurement works over the range of uh, air masses that it does. Any other questions or comments? Okay, there we go. Yep. I have a more practical question. You said that the traveling is a, a measure when you can lose the calibration of the instrument. But if we have no other option to make a calibration of the instrument rather than send it to the place where we have a reference, so how it can be avoided and maybe as a um, recommendation how we can arrange the travel of the brewer. So to min minimize the... Well, I per personally... My attitude is, if you really need the instrument to be working properly when it gets where it's going, you should hand carry it, right? Not let it out of your sight, because you don't know what happens to it when, when you don't have it. And of course, we tend to, uh, toward using the traveling standard approach, because what, the way the traveling standard thing works is you, you calibrate it against a reference, and then you send it around to a number of stations, and then you bring it back and compare it to the reference again. And if it compares well at the end of the trip, you can assume that it was behaving well all around the trip. But if you just send the instrument somewhere, calibrate it and bring it back, you've got to be sure that nothing happened to it in between. Right? Otherwise, you might collect data for two years and not know whether it's any good. So it's, all, it's always a risk. Because if we make a production, make a calibration enough to send to the other part of the world, we don't know what we have at the other end. There's always a risk, yeah. That's, that's why we favor the traveling standard, because by, by the end of the trip, you know that it did the trip safely. Right? Okay. Thank you. And of course, you don't really want to send your instrument somewhere for, for three or four weeks, because you lose three or four weeks of data. Right? 